So um, I want to welcome everyone. I want to thank everyone for joining today's um, webinar here. Uh, it's the first of our 2021 series um, with the STEM Leadership Alliance and the STEM Happens Network. I just wanted everyone to see Roy Harris there. And Roy um, is our professional development. He has a world of experience um, and it's an honor to have him as part of the STEM Happens Network team. And um, uh, Salvador Fernandez is having a trouble right now getting in for the moment. Um, and he's the uh, president of the STEM Happens Network, and he will be with us momentarily as well. And the final person of our team is Rosa Lagana, and she supports our IT and all of our technical support. So I just want to give a shout out and thank them as well. So I feel that Michael does not need an introduction. He is the leading expert in this whole COVID-19. I'm really excited about this webinar today. So Michael, I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. And welcome everyone to this webinar. And for those of you who don't know me, because I'm sure there's quite a few that don't, let me give you a little bit of my background so you understand where I'm coming from and how best to use this presentation. I started out my professional life as a biologist at Woods Hole, Massachusetts. I was into marine biology. I was teaching up at Boston University doing my research here on Cape Cod. But then I decided I was more interested in teaching than I was in doing research. So I left graduate school, got my master's actually in virology, uh, then went on teaching K-12, and I did that for about 10 years. And in fact, this shot is interesting. There's a current movie playing on Netflix about Challenger, and there's a clip with me and Tom Brokaw, and this image still is from that clip, uh, and talking about space education and teachers going into space. Well, I went back to graduate school, uh, picked up my doctorate in education, started writing textbooks, developing educational television, writing commercial trade books, all focused on science, a few on puzzles, optical illusions, but really my main focus is on science literacy. But looking at the pieces I put together so far, what I am most proud of is the work that I did on HIV education two decades ago. I wrote the National Curriculum on Teaching the Science of HIV, which was published by NSTA. We also had a television show that aired on the Discovery Channel. We featured a younger Anthony Fauci on that. Also, I wrote a number of commercial pieces. One of those was a book, question and answer book, on HIV AIDS. So in many ways, uh, I am pre-adapted to going and diving into COVID-19 education. Goals for this presentation are as follows. I want to empower you with understanding because from understanding comes changes in behavior. In that understanding, I'll be presenting a primer on the science of COVID-19 and also on SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes that disease. Also, I am going to profile specific STEM connections and look at how STEM integrates into the big picture of COVID-19. Part of this will include demystifying the nucleic acid vaccines. These are wonderful products of bioengineering. And these, in my own belief, will give us our semblance of what normality will look like in hopefully beginning in, in several months from now. But the process is going to take a little bit longer than that. And finally, I'd like to point you to applicable resources. And in fact, let's start with that. Most of you are familiar with Twitter. Please join me, sign up for my Twitter account, follow me at M Despezio. My Twitter account does not have me sipping cappuccino with cats on my lap. Basically, it is all focused on COVID-19 information, education, and really literacy for both the general public and also for educators and administrators. You can get there if you're not familiar with Twitter, go to at mdespezio. If you use a search engine such as Google, you may have these options to click on. Click on any one of those and it will open up my Twitter feed. As you see, it's richly illustrated. It is quite varied in what I offer. In fact, I want to look at a couple of my last tweets because this is very important. You can see there's 
one that says understanding face mask immunity. And this is incredible. Beneath that, there is a piece from the Journal of General Internal Medicine uh, talking about how masks can help or the possibility of masks setting up a vaccine-like immunity. But I'll let you read more about that if you visit my tweets or follow the hot links that I offer on that. Also, I have a blog which takes a deeper dive in the science of COVID-19. My last blog is entitled, How Many Coronaviruses Do You Need to Get Sick? Because our body has an innate immune response that can deal with dozens of viruses. Probably the tipping point may be at 100 or so if SARS-CoV-2 acts like SARS-CoV, as that virus does. But if we get exposed to minor amounts which our body can deal with and eradicate before they establish infection, there is a chance that that event will stimulate the production of immune cells which can generate antibodies and prep us for the return of the actual virus. In other words, it can give us a type of vaccine-like immunity. But you can learn more about that at my blogs. Also, if you're just learning about the science of COVID-19, I have a fair amount of background in there. This is all about vaccinations, explaining what they are. If you're looking for activities, STEM activities specifically, you can find a number of activities that I've written and are posted and hosted by my publishers, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. You can see that they are for different grade bands, I've written them according to the standards and according to grade appropriate sophistication. So access those activities. If you're looking at having kids engage in hands-on, minds-on experiences on which to construct an understanding of COVID-19. Also, I have online science lessons. Go to YouTube, put in my last name, or just go to my Twitter and they'll direct you to these lessons. And now let's look at science standards. If we went trying to find COVID-19, we wouldn't find anything in standards, which makes sense because it's a fairly recent phenomenon. However, if we went looking for viruses, nothing comes up. We really have to construct our understanding of what COVID-19 is all about. But we can look at some of the basic tenets of NGSS. And in those science standards, we're finding out that our teaching needs to be more facilitation, not pontification. It needs to be process driven with the science and engineering practices. People are very aware of that in the STEM fields. Also, we need to profile interconnectedness. And that too is very important for STEM because STEM is much more than science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It is an integration of many other topic areas, including arts, the fine arts. In New York City, I had the great fortune of presenting for several years in a row a workshop on using the iPad in the classroom so that not only teachers can use the iPad, but students can use that and use that to report on their findings the way scientists do now. Or literacy. Literacy is another important part of STEM. Um, if we look at David McCullough, and many of you are probably familiar with this author, one of the best authors that's out there. In his book, The Great Bridge, he describes the Brooklyn Bridge as being a harmony of opposing forces. The steel and the cables in tension and the granite in the towers in compression. That is poetry. That is brilliant. And that is also a part of good STEM education. Also, there needs to be opportunities for self-discovery, a focus on deep understanding, and there has to be a real-world connection. It needs to be meaningful. And if we look at engineering and engineering challenges, which I will highlight in this presentation, we find that COVID-19 offers up a perfect anchoring phenomenon that we can address many aspects and expand it out all nesting within this anchoring phenomenon. There are an assortment 
of engineering design opportunities, which I will profile and I will gate them and talk about them specifically when we cover the appropriate content. Now remember, science is not engineering. Engineering is onto itself. And in fact, in this presentation, since many of you are more familiar with science, I'm gonna focus more about the tenets of engineering. And as I said, engineering is not science. Engineering is all about problem solving. And it's also about meeting the needs, where science really furthers the understanding of the human species. In engineering, we're looking at helping out by solving problems, meeting needs. Now, let me begin the story. It begins back in early December, when in Wuhan, China, there is an individual who comes to the hospital, and this individual has certain symptoms, and these are symptoms of pneumonia, including cough, difficulty breathing, loss of appetite, and fever. They began looking for a common cause of this pneumonia and they could not find one. Now, often you get one individual presenting symptoms of a disorder and that just goes away and nothing else comes of it. However, what had happened in Wuhan in December was that other cases began appearing. And when you have a number of cases occurring in a similar geographic area or within a similar time, we have what is called a cluster. And certainly if you look here at this map, we seem to have a concentration. And this was the Hunan Seafood Market. Now this seafood market had a connection to about half of the cases that were reported by the early January. It was a wet market, meaning that there were quite a few different exotic animals that were sold at the market, in addition to poultry and to fish. One of them, the pangolin, also called the scaly anteater, was thought to be the animal which transferred the virus to the human population. Now we look at that and most likely not. It was a great story but the pangolin was probably not involved. We may never know the true route in which this virus entered the human population, but probably not due to the pangolin. Patient zero, let's get back to that individual who presented symptoms in Wuhan. Now, was this individual in early December, patient zero, was this the index case? Most likely, not. Why? Well, this was an elderly individual. He had symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and he lived several bus transfers from the seafood market, which means it was highly unlikely that he was visiting that market. It's interesting because as epidemiologists try and construct the early history of COVID-19, they don't know how and when it was brought into the market. But it might have been a secondary infection from somebody who was infected earlier, possibly in November, in October. And if we're looking at some of the work now, trying to track down viruses based upon fetal exams, um, looking at, uh, excuse me, fecal exams, we're, we're seeing that something which might extend months and months before this time frame. Okay, engineering challenges. Just to keep this in mind as we go through. Obviously, we're looking at a illness which requires treatment, medical technology, something to bring up to students. How do we develop medical technology to address COVID-19? What about telemedicine? If you're looking at one of the major growing fields in technology in STEM, it is telemedicine and you know it is going to stick around after this pandemic has ended. What about contact tracing? Can students develop ways to follow contacts? Quarantine compliance. Is there a way to use cell phones, iPads, or other electronics 
that you're able to make sure that people are being compliant with are being compliant with quarantining. Hang on one second. Identified as a coronavirus. Well, pretty soon what had happened in China was that the pathogen causing pneumonia was identified as what's called a coronavirus. Now this is a scanning, excuse me, a transmission electron microscope image, a TEM image showing a coronavirus. Coronaviruses, by the way, get their name by the presence of this S or spike protein. You can see it right there. It creates what appears to be a corona or a crown around this pathogen. Now, coronaviruses are found in a family of viruses, all related, having similar genetic structure, having those spikes that make it look like a crown surrounding the virion, the outer part of that virus particle. And they have been studied since the 1960s. Actually, they were implicated in poultry diseases early in the 1900s. But in the 1960s, there were several species that were looked at the cause of the common cold. In fact, it's believed that 10% or maybe even a greater number of common colds are caused by coronaviruses. Not the coronaviruses that cause COVID-19, but other species of coronavirus. Now, these are the mild species. Later on, things changed, and they began changing in 2002 in Guangdong Province, China, when a totally different type of coronavirus appeared. This coronavirus caused a disease called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this is an image showing SARS-CoV, coronavirus. So we're looking at another of these TEM images that is showing a highly magnified collection of these potentially fatal, they can cause very severe symptoms, viruses. Now, coronaviruses can jump host. Scientists call that being zoonotic. And if we look at SARS, we believe that the initial reservoir where these viruses were initially found were in the bat. They jumped from the bat to a cat called a civet. And from the civet population, possibly from a wet market, they jumped into the humans. So you can see that viruses don't stay in one species. These specifically have jumped from a bat population where we have reservoirs of different types of coronaviruses to the civet, then to the human. Now, in 2012, about a decade later, another severe type of coronavirus appeared. This one appeared in the Middle East and it caused a disorder called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. Once again, if we look at the virus that's causing it, MERS-CoV, you can see the similarities in what this virus looks like. This is another great area of technology for students to look at as far as magnification, looking at TEMs, looking at scanning electron microscopes, looking at lenses, exploring the physics of optics. This is just a very rich landscape for STEM application. This virus also was zoonotic, but its root probably came straight from the Arabian camel into the human population. Then in December 2019 in Wuhan, China, the third very severe type of coronavirus appeared. And this coronavirus, now we refer to it SARS-CoV-2, was initially known as the COVID-19 virus. Originally, SARS was not in the name because they feared that this would alarm too many people uh, of a coming type of epidemic that we are now in the pandemic of. Epidemic. 
epidemic, we have an expanding outbreak. Now, in December 2019, we have that cluster. By January 1st, there's about 60 cases of pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan. So we still have not yet locked down what pathogen is causing the pneumonia. However, they're soon to find out. By January 13th, the first case is found outside of China. By January 20th, the first case in the United States in the state of Washington is uncovered. And you can see that right here. Now, if you look at the deaths on the right and look at that number, here's where we were in January 30th, 2020. And on January 30th, with these numbers, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency. And for a moment, I want to profile what I think is one of the best sites in communicating data about the COVID-19 pandemic. That is the John Hopkins dashboard. If you're not familiar with it, you should be. You can access it through the URL at the bottom. You can also go to my Twitter account, and I have hot links that bring you right there. Or if you just put down coronavirus John Hopkins in one of your browsers, you will certainly arrive at this incredible site. And there we are today when we look now at global deaths being over 1 million. One other thing about the site, this is another concept that students might want to look at in STEM education. How do you communicate what scientists know to not only other scientists, but to a general population? Pandemic. After we have an epidemic, we have the pandemic. Pandemic description is quite subjective. You can see that here the CDC refers to it as an epidemic that is spread over several countries or continents, usually affecting a large number of people. Notice we don't have definites on the numbers of other countries or the numbers of people. However, by March 12th, the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 a pandemic. It has a global impact. Now let's talk a little bit about the nature of epidemics in pandemics. There's something called an R naught value, R sub zero. And this is the expected number of new cases that are generated by one case within a susceptible population. Another way of looking at this is how many people will one person who was infected likely to infect without any sort of mitigation? Now, this number is a moving value because as we learn more about the virus, we learn more about how to protect ourselves and this R naught value can change. So the R naught value is not definitive. There's other values. However, the R naught value is frequently profiled when you look at how people are responding to various types of epidemics. Let's look at these R naught values, what they mean. Measles has a very high one, 12 to 18, which means one individual without mitigation is likely to infect 12 to 18 others. Then we have chicken pox. The common cold is only two to three. Seasonal flu is less than that. And COVID-19, boy, these numbers do vary since I've been following this since February. Uh, and now the estimates come in anywhere between two to six, so that one person is likely to infect two to six. However, this doesn't tell the true story because this is averaged out. Because if we look at the nature of how COVID-19 spreads, generally you have super spreaders. You have one person who is infected who spreads it to quite a few other people, where most people who become infected don't spread it to others. Interesting concept in how one looks at epidemiology. Now, why do epidemics spread so rapidly? It all has to do with mathematics, and this is a great connection for STEM. And I go back to the old rice on the chessboard fable, updated a little, where this peasant had performed a task for her queen. She went to the queen and said, look, um, I did it, and the queen, oh, this is wonderful. I love what you did. What would you like? Would you like money? Would you like land? And she says to the queen, look, my needs are modest. Let's take out this chessboard. And she puts out a chessboard, and she says, all I want you to do is to place 
one grain of rice on that first square, double that two grains on the next, double it four grains on the next, eight on the next, 16. Just keep doubling the number of grains until we fill the chessboard. That's all that I want, your highness. And the queen thinks about that. And so, hey, sounds good to me. Sure, you got it. But what the queen doesn't realize is the power of geometric progression. Because by the time you get to that 64th square, that is the number of grains of rice that are placed on that square or that you need to give to the servant who you are rewarding. Now, it's interesting to note that that amount of rice is equal to about 300 times the global production of rice. The queen wasn't very happy. I think uh, the ending to the fable that I heard was that instead of getting the rice, uh, that servant was, was then beheaded. Not a nice ending to the story, but you get the point with the power of exponential growth. In fact, I have an activity. This is available at that Houghton Mifflin Harcourt site. You can download these PDFs. Again, just put my last name in, HMH, or log on to my Twitter, and you'll get a connection to this. There is an activity I'm currently working on, and let me put that one out as well, because a number of you I know work with teachers and are teachers of younger children. This is a wonderful STEAM activity. I put more of the art in that, and I call it covering up, where you have a child draw a picture of themselves, then draw an outline of their hand, carefully cut out that outline so it looks like that, and then you can make an art project by positioning a tissue above the nose, so just simulating what one should do if they sneeze, or if they cough, or even better than that, the child can then cut out face coverings and then tape them over their drawing of themselves. So you can see that there's quite a few different ways you can take activities, but these are critical because you need to have students involved to construct an understanding, and part of that construction comes through process learning. Now it's time for you to become a student. Because remember when I started, I said I was going to talk a little bit about the science, not necessarily just the STEM teaching. But let's talk about the science of viruses and the science of SARS-CoV-2. Most of us are familiar with non-living and living as categories in which we can place objects. No problem in placing rocks, ice, water, or the sun in the non-living category. In the living category, we have animals, we have plants, we have organisms that seem to live between the two. But we can look at the living and we can say that what makes things living is that they share a number of characteristics, including responding to stimuli, using energy, growing and changing, having a metabolism, having chemical reactions, reproducing, having a form of cellular organization. And if we look at that, let's look at the cell, which is the basic building block of all life. It carries on the life processes. It has structure and it has function. And it has within it what are called cell organelles. These little pieces of the cell, which are surrounded by membranes that have specific functions. And we can look at a typical cell such as this. We have the inner sanctum called the nucleus, and the nucleus houses the genetic code, the blueprints of the cell, the blueprints of life as DNA. We also have other cell parts, such as the mitochondria, organelles which are responsible for getting the energy the cell needs to maintain the life processes. We have cell membrane that's found both in the outer plasma membrane, the outer exterior membrane, but also in inner membranes. And they're made of the same similar type of material, a bilipid membrane. So we can find that in different parts of the cell. And in this cell membrane, we also have smaller parts called protein factories. These are the ribosomes. These make the proteins. And it's proteins that really make what the organism is. So it's our protein content, which helps differentiate a human from an amoeba. Now, what about a virus? 
What is a virus made of? Well, throw out everything, disregard everything that I just talked about. Viruses are the ultimate parasites with an unbelievable, simple structure which reflects their very unique way of survival, just replication. What a virus is made up of basically is a protein shell and a blueprint, which can either be made from either RNA or DNA. One of the two nucleic acids is what the virus blueprint will be stored in. Now, if we were to build a simple virus, we start by putting protein building blocks, capsomeres together, and we're able to build in its most simplest form a hollow. And in that hollow, we place the virus blueprints right here. And then we cover that up and protect those blueprints. Some viruses have a little bit more complex form. They also have some added components within this inner shell. But the viruses I want to talk about now in coronaviruses, they have another outer layer which is wrapped around that protein shell. Actually, in the case of coronaviruses, the protein shell is not different from the nucleic acid. They are fused together in what is called a nucleocapsid, fancy word for meaning that the protein is bound to that nucleic acid, which is then found and wrapped within this lipid layer, which is then studded by other proteins. And you're probably familiar with these proteins because these are the spike proteins that are the targets for vaccines. Scale and structure, an important concept when we begin to look at NGSS and we look at things, concepts that we want students to connect. And here we have SARS-CoV-2. The virus particle itself is mostly spherical. It's called pleomorphic, so it kind of approaches spherical, and you can see that in this TEM image. They are small, extremely small. How small are they? Well, you could probably fit about 15,000, 15,000 SARS-CoV-2 particles, one next to the other across the diameter of a pinhead. That is small. To give you another reference to the size of SARS-CoV-2, we're going to place the virus next to a cell type that it might infect. And you can see the size of that virus compared to the cell. So the cell obviously cannot have those, excuse me, the virus obviously cannot have those cellular components, the cellular organelles. It's too small to have those much larger organelles that you can see here stuffed within that virion stuffed within the virus particle itself. This is another great area for students to look at STEM in making models. So they can make models that represent the virus. They can make models that represent the virus in the potential host cell. And remember, if we're looking at the modern use of models in the classroom, this isn't just a pretty decoration something that's just going to sit on the shelf. It has to be used to further understanding. So students can use this to teach. They can use it to learn more about the virus. If we look at the outer part of SARS-CoV-2, we find that there's a virus covering which is made of fabric. And you know where that fabric comes from? It comes from an inner membrane of the cell that that virus infects. It snips it out, wraps itself around in that membrane, and then it studs that membrane with different types of proteins, but the one most of us are familiar with is that spike or that S protein. We cut open the virus particle. What we find is that the inner sanctum has the RNA, the ribonucleic acid, the blueprint for this virus, and remember I told you it was bound to a protein, but we have the blueprint, which is found right in that inner sanctum. What another, it's another great subject for students to model. At the higher end, we can look at that actual blueprint 
And I just finished a lab activity, which is now posted on that HMH site, which explores the genome, the blueprints of the SARS-CoV-2 particle in terms of high school sophistication. What about stages of virus replication? How does a virus replicate? Well, let's look at a basic understanding of this. First, the virus needs to invade the cell, and that begins when the virus attaches to the surface. It then goes inside of the cell. Once inside the cell, the virus takes it over, and it takes it over by releasing the virus blueprint. And this virus blueprint hijacks the cell's machinery so that no longer is the cell manufacturing things that are good for keeping the cell alive, but the cell is now manufacturing new virus particles. As these new virus particles are manufactured, they are released into the surroundings and they go off and infect a new host cell. And that is the life cycle of a virus. Very simple. So you can see that a virus does nothing to support the living condition that we see in all sorts of cells. All it does is it the ultimate parasite that contains the blueprints for hijacking a host cell and making that cell change its manufacturing process so that all it does is it makes new viruses. Now what that does is it can injure those host cells. It can show, cause changes in the cell structure. It can overwork the cell's biochemical and biosynthetic machinery. It can also injure the cell by cutting out pieces of that inner membrane. All of this can lead to the death of a cell, but it can also trigger cell suicide or in some ways flag that cell for removal by the immune system. So there are many ways in which an infected host cell can die. And then what we're looking at is how does this then impact the health of a person? So now we're gonna jump in scale and structure from the cellular damage to the organismal damage. We have something called ARDS, the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And this is in the most severe stages of COVID-19 symptoms. And this is where a ventilator is needed. It helps assist the person because without this assist, this person is in danger of dying from respiratory distress. And if we look at what goes on within the lung at that system's level, within the lung, you may be familiar with a bit of its anatomy. We have tiny air sacs, the alveoli. These alveoli have a rich network of capillaries, blood vessels surrounding them. And what happens is as you breathe, oxygen comes into your lungs, passes through a very thin epithelial, is then transferred to red blood cells, which brings the oxygen around the body. But what happens when you get COVID-19 is that debris interferes with that free passage of oxygen. And so we begin to have problems with getting oxygen. And that's why monitoring oxygen levels is a very important thing in individuals who have COVID-19. COVID-19 can also cause what's called a cytokine storm, which are your own chemical messengers popping up your immune response to a point that it's dangerous for the person. This changes your permeability of the blood vessel so that now more fluid with the immune cells leak out of the capillaries. And in this case, since it's affecting the lung tissue, you have more fluid entering the lungs. Think about it. Yeah, it's a problem, an increased problem with pneumonia. And so what we wanna do is decrease the cytokine storm. And what they found out early was that you can give steroids to people in the most serious stages of COVID-19, give them steroids, which are synthetic hormone analogs. And the one which is given to people in those stages is dexamethasone. And this can abate the storm. So 
right now, I am still trying to process what the president had, what stage did he have, because this is usually reserved for those serious times when you need to ensure that the cytokine storm is not damaging the tissue and leading to a decline, a further decline into the person's health. Engineering challenges, engineering ventilators, having kids work on developing ways of helping ventilate a person. What about developing personal protective equipment? Can students come up with better ways of developing face masks, maybe other types of protection as well? What about bioengineering therapeutics? And that is where this future may lie. Because if we look at some sort of stability for this, we've got a new normal and that new normal is gonna be established through effective vaccination, which is all based upon antigen antibody reactions, which you may be familiar with from back in school. Antigens are things that are foreign to the body and they initiate an immune response and that immune response is to create complementary molecules that will bind to the antigen. Those are called antibodies. So in the case of a COVID-19 virus that we have here, those spike proteins that I talked about before, which are illustrated in red, they look like little red cauliflowers here, are the antigens. The body then begins to build a population of antibodies, which will then mask and deactivate the virus. And this is what you try and do with vaccinations. Traditionally, there have been two types of vaccinations, attenuated vaccinations and inactivated vaccinations. Attenuated means these are the weakened form of the pathogen. And the immune response respond, or the immune system responds to a very uh, weakened form of the disease. You get that when you get vaccinated against measles and mumps. Another types of vaccination use inactivated vaccines. These are where the pathogens are chopped up so that they are inactivated. They don't set up an infection. Uh, you probably had that in your polio. But the problem with this type of vaccine is that you need to be revaccinated. So this is where boosters come in. When we begin to look at these vaccines, and I suggest that all of you check out, there is a wonderful vaccine and there's also a therapeutic tractor that the New York Times has available for free. Go there, check it out. And you'll be able to see, this came from yesterday's or this morning's coronavirus vaccine tracker. You can see where the vaccines are, which ones are winning, which phases. You can also learn about the phases and what that means to availability of these potential game changers. The SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are the major forerunners right now are nucleic acid vaccines. These are DNA or RNA vaccines. And what these vaccines do, like the virus, they hijack human cells and they direct them to make something different. In this case, you have them make the spikes, not the viruses, just the spikes that are found in the viruses and they're released in your body and your body sees these foreign spikes and makes antibodies against them. So then when the actual virus appears, you already have a population of antibodies that can address the new infection. One of the leading front runners is the RNA vaccine, Moderna. You've heard of that one before. It's also known as the mRNA-1273. This has an RNA code for making the S protein. The delivery is through tiny little sacs called liposomes. And these are tiny. You can see that it's made up of a membrane that looks like the cell membrane. There's a reason for that. Because what we do is we place the RNA code in the liposome. It binds to the surface of a cell within the person after you inject it into the person. There the RNA is released. It goes to the ribosomes. The ribosomes begin to crank out, to be, begin to manufacture the spike protein. It floods your system, your body reacts to it, and then you make the antibodies which give you immunity to the virus. This is brilliant. And this is an example of bioengineering. The other front runner that you've probably heard about is the Oxford vaccine, slightly different. And this one, instead of having an RNA code, it uses a DNA code, but it also makes 
spike protein. Some of these DNA vaccines code for different parts of that spike protein. So you're not building the whole spike, just a piece which is the most effective in developing an antibody against. The vector for this is not a simple liposome, but it is a chimpanzee adenovirus that has been weakened. Incredible. So we're repurposing a virus, replacing a genetic code for making SARS-CoV, excuse me, this, yeah, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein into this virus, injecting it in the vaccine into a person. The virus goes to a cell in your body. There, it releases the DNA. The DNA doesn't go to the chromosomes, but then the DNA makes RNA copies, which go out to the ribosomes. The ribosomes make spike protein from the virus. Your body recognizes this foreign antigen. In response, it makes the antibodies, and this gives you immunity to the virus. There's plenty more to learn about. How long will this immunity last? No one knows. We're hoping it's gonna be there for a while, or we might need boosters. But again, you can find out more about this on the web or just visiting my blog. Now let's get back to the new normal as I bring this to closure and we'll take some questions. This really is a game changer in so many different ways, but I think one has to look at it for an opportunity for teaching STEM in a new way. Certainly you have new material, but we are placed in a different situation, whether we're teaching hybrid, whether we're teaching face-to-face -face in a very different type of environment, or whether we're teaching completely online, the strategies of education are changing. And we need to embrace that. And we need to hone in our skills for these changes in delivery. And on that note, I wanna thank you all for being with me. Remember, log on to my Twitter, definitely follow me, or if not following me, just visit at M. Despezio, and you will be kept up to date on the recent research. I'll send you out to those articles, but I will also demystify what they say, the articles that are in general interest and really impact the pandemic or what we experience within this pandemic of COVID-19, or go to my blog, and you'll certainly get a much deeper dive into this sophistication. And on that note, I want to thank you all, and I am going to pass the baton uh, back to Kelly. Thank you, Michael. Um, I really appreciate this, and, and it's always so informative. There's just so much information there. And again, I encourage everyone, you know, to please um, visit the resources that Michael have sh has shared. We also have information on the STEM Leadership Alliance website, as well as the STEM Happens Network website. So Michael, I wanna jump into the questions right away. Um, one of the first questions that we had, and I'm curious about this one as well, are we gonna spend the rest of our lives wearing a mask in public? Good question. Uh, my guess, my own feeling, uh, and again, you know, people are gonna say different things, most likely not. Um, I believe what will happen if indeed these vaccines pan out with the way they appear to be going in the trials, is that we're going to have some sort of handle on the spread. Plus, there's gonna be a number of people that are naturally exposed to the virus. You're gonna have a number of people who will develop immunity from getting the vaccines and who knows, and here's where my fingers are crossed on getting this immunity by wearing masks. Who knows? I mean, I don't even wanna go into the, that needs a lot more research to look at that. Uh, but my best guess is that probably uh, by next year at this time, uh, in many places, masks will be off. Uh, and I think that that may occur sooner in other places, but I don't want to give a date on that. Uh, so I don't believe, I don't believe that we will need to be wearing them, but certainly there will be lessons learned. There will be some lessons learned on how best to stop the next COVID-19 that appears, because this is only one instance of the virus jumping host. What happens when another coronavirus or another pathogen or a more serious strain of flu or a type of virus which has a much higher mutation rate 
jumps host and begins impacting the humans. We need to be ready to deal with it in the sense. So the concept of mass wearing may remain within us and jumping on it quicker to stopping the associated spread of the disease. Thank you for that. Um, and that's actually good to know too, because I think we're all a little tired of the mask wearing at times. Um, one of the questions, and I, several people have asked this, um, and it, it tends to be for a younger audience. And so, um, you know, we're, we're talking about pre-K to fifth grade. And so one of those is, you know, how do you do this virtually with these younger students? How do you effectively um, implement the STEM virtually? And how do you have these appropriate conversations about COVID? And, and I loved when you showed the cell, because I just remember personally with my children, you know, it was around that time, fourth, fifth grade, you know, they're bringing the cell and they're doing, you know, they were bringing it into the classroom and stuff. But, you know, what, what recommendations do you have for these teachers that are working with the younger students and science has become a little lost, let alone STEM, what recommendations do you have? That is a great question. Um, and that, that's one that I'm looking at right now. I'm trying to duplicate what I did with HIV education with COVID-19 education, which means I'm looking at developing a fairly rich offering that will address the different grade bands on how best to teach it. Right now it's piecemeal. If I go onto the web and I do a you know, search for the best materials, I am not finding many of them that are out there. Many of them especially that need to address NGSS approach to understanding. So be aware that there is not that much that is available. There are certain pieces that are there, uh, but most of them do not embrace our modern pedagogy for teaching science topics. Now, things that you might want to be, which, which you probably can do and might want to follow up on, is we've been teaching hygiene and health science for a while, especially at those grade levels. Although looking at coronaviruses or viruses may be beyond the conceptual understanding of the youngest students, there are pieces in there which are essential that they learn. Pieces such as spread of germs, that you can do simple activities. Uh, one of my favorites, and again, you can access that at the, at the site, uh, is the old traditional one where you have flour and you put flour on your hands and you touch it down to construction paper and then you touch the flour imprint on the construction paper and you're able to transfer it to another sheet of construction paper. Then with a clean hand, you can transfer that to the next and you're looking at the spread of germs and you're able then based upon your observations to you know, see where this is going. You're able to infer what might happen with a pathogen, with a germ. What are, should you be teaching viruses at that level? Well, probably not the specifics of viruses, but there are certain pieces which, especially if we begin to look at cross-cutting concepts in NGSS, which are applicable at that level. Certainly the SCPs are there. When we begin to look, however, at the disciplinary core content, you don't have much out there at any of the grade bands, which means that this is an area that I'm working on now to develop. So stay tuned, follow me, because I hope to have a larger piece that's out there for K-12 teachers and even for college teachers, ideally within the next three months. Thank you. Um, and I know we probably only have time for one more question, but one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, Michael, um, is I'm going to send these questions over to you. And I mean, a lot of them I kind of grouped together there, but, um, you know, there may be some additional information if you want to just answer those and then we can just share them out to um, those that have attended today as well as place it on the website too. Um, I, I do want to get to this one um, question here about the connection of COVID and the sense of taste or smell. And should we be concerned about the long-term uh, neurological effects? Great question. More and more stuff is coming out. We don't know yet what those long-term effects are. If they're around, uh, many people recover their sense of taste and smell, uh, not immediately after a 14-day period, but several months later, they seem to get it back. But there are other types of effects 
um, which seem to be much more harmful to the body, which is this whole set, the whole impact that we don't know a lot about. Uh, again, this is so new and we're learning it and SARS-CoV-2 is different than SARS-CoV. So it is a different virus. Although its genetic code may be similar, there are enough differences to suggest that we are dealing with a different species causing different, different types of symptoms. And again, we don't know yet. Um, and it's, it's, it's a concept that scientists, physicians, epidemiologists will learn more about as time goes by. But certainly many of the people who I know that have had COVID have lingering symptoms. Uh, it can be confusion. It can be issues that showing injury to their lung, uh, because remember, this is all attacking certain types of epithelial cells that are in the lung that are exhibiting ACE2 receptors. And what is going on there? What sort of lung lesions? What is going to, what is the impact of these lesions later on in life? We don't know yet. And that's why it's extremely important that if you're not infected, protect yourself, wear masks, keep the social distance. What we're showing or what we're seeming to see is that the less amount of viruses that you're exposed to, the less of a chance that you're going to get COVID-19 and the less serious those symptoms might be. We don't have definitives on this, but the research and the data suggests that the degree depends upon that inoculum, that initial dose that you receive. It may not pan out, but that's what it seems to be. But certainly the more that you go to an area where the viruses are dispersed, going outside, not going into an area with, that is a closed room that has poor ventilation, you're more likely to get your infectious dose there than you are going to an outside area. Well, thank you for that, Michael. And I was just gonna ask, we did have a question. If you could just put in the chat room real quick, um, uh, the links that you had sent, um, and you can also send those directly to me. I did mention to all of the participants, sure. we were going to um, send out information afterwards, so we'll make sure you have that information. I wanna thank Michael. Um, I, I never get tired of listening to his expertise. I think this is something that is so relevant for students in the classroom. And if we're talking about it, our kids need to understand it. They need to understand how to break this down. And I think there's ways that we can do it. Michael has supplied a variety of resources. So Michael, we really wanna thank you for that. Well, um, the other thing I just wanna um, share with everyone is on, um, we actually have a partnership with NASA and Microsoft and they are starting on October 14th, a live event on Talk to an a a NASA Astronaut. And it's really interesting. They have um, these free resources through the Microsoft Education Center. We'll be sending information out about that as well. Um, but one of the things they've done a really great job with is called Hacking STEM. And it's a way that students can explore data on astronauts, on space missions, on the world, and really, you know, kind of link this all to um, spreadsheets at any age level and graphing and all of this. It's, there's some really cool tools there. So you'll be hearing more about that. Um, the first event is October 14th at 10 a.m. and that's Pacific um, time. Um, and they're gonna talk with NASA astronauts and rocket scientists. So we'll be sending more information about that. And I also think some of the data of what they're showing how to do could also be leveraged with what Michael was talking about with COVID-19. So there's definitely some interconnection there. So again, we wanna thank everyone um, for your time and for participating with us. And just stay tuned, we'll be getting more information out to you. And if you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to reach out to myself, to Roy, to this, uh, Rosa or Sal, the entire STEM Happens Network and STEM Leadership Alliance team, we're here to help you as well. So with that, I wanna sign off with Michael, thank him as always, and please, 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 Follow him on Twitter because I love getting those updates. So it's great information. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody.